So I think we're steady at 22. So let, let's go ahead and get started and uh, welcome everybody. And uh, thanks for coming to this discussion. Uh, I'm John Samet, the uh, Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health and uh, with me, and I think well-known to everybody, uh, Christine uh, Gillen, do you wanna say hello, Christine? And Hi everyone, I'm Christine Gillen. I'm the Associate Dean of Administration and Finance. And Sam? I am Sam Awini. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty. And Bobby, who got us organized to be here. So. Hi, I'm Bobby Ortega. I'm Dean Sammet's assistant. So um, welcome, and I hope everybody had a, uh, a good three-day uh, three uh, weekend. So um, why don't we go to the first slide, um, okay. Can you see the slide? The, yeah, yes, we can. Okay. There you go. And so just a, a little bit to talk about why we're together and uh, having this town hall. And I think uh, probably most of you are aware that the School of Medicine undertook changes uh, in the uh, individuals who were uh, on board as PRAs, uh, making changes uh, of the PRA series to a staff um, series. You know, given the changes in the School of Medicine, uh, which, which of course has large numbers of um, employees, far larger than the school, there are implications for us in terms of uh, that institution making changes. We are considering the implications of the School of Medicine changes and whether we should be considering changes as well to the PRA series, not necessarily those made by the School of Medicine, but what we think may work best for our school. So getting together today is to have a conversation about this and to get your um, input and views. What we're going to do is um, introduce, uh, Christine will introduce what the School of Medicine has done. And Sam is going to uh, review uh, our current uh, PRA structure. And I just want to be clear that we have not decided on what the path forward will be. We want to do this in a deliberate fashion, giving consideration to um, the implications of going and staying where we are or going in one direction um, or another. And this um, meeting today is really a part of a having an open and transparent process where we have um, input from uh, everyone. And, and of course, those who are PRAs now are critical stakeholders in whatever changes may be made. So just wanna emphasize that this meeting is for conversation and for obtaining uh, input. We have a few thoughts about topics we should touch on, but you know anything is open for, um, discussion. And it's not that, you know, we're expecting to hear from you comments or questions that might come with expectations of answers, because this is really about changing, about obtaining uh, input as we consider what direction to, uh, to go. So if we don't want to disappoint you in not answering questions, just want to make clear what the purpose of uh, today's session is. So with that, let me hand things off to Christine. Hold on, I was hoping my arrow would work. Okay. John, can you see the next slide? Yeah, I do see. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we thought we would just make sure everyone had the same level of understanding of what has occurred in the School of Medicine. So the School of Medicine launched a research personnel initiative, and they stated these are slides that are taken directly from the School of Medicine um, PowerPoint that was given last winter. So the why behind the School of Medicine's initiative is that they received feedback from the research community that there was lack of career progression, inability to identify the primary and distinct research functions, and inability to understand the market salaries for PRAs and senior PRAs. They wanted to more effectively recruit, define career paths and requirements, and respond to market forces. Um, they established that they were doing this as investment in their research personnel, um, which is a critical priority for the School of Medicine and CU Anschutz campus. 
and the research personnel are the instrumental in their scientific discovery on our campus. And they decided that by investing in their growth and development, they are helping PRAs and senior PRAs reach even greater heights. The School of Medicine project objectives and outcomes were to tackle career planning, targeted job classifications, and accurate benchmarking. They did this by providing framework where leaders were able to develop career progression plans for their team members in each of their units. And they capitalized on existing university staff career pro progression success. They targeted three job classifications and they established three um, job families, I'll call them, which were clinical research, information and computational research, and laboratory research. And they allowed for focused job titles based on duties and descriptions. They also then went back to the market and did some benchmarking to build the foundation for accurate compensation setting. They did an equity analysis and a market analysis and then they were able to, in their belief, recruit, retain, and respond to market forces. Their project goals were reducing turnover, increasing retention, attracting more candidates with higher posted ranges, increasing productivity, morale, engagement, more flexibility with salary offers once compression pressures were relieved, and more ability to dedicate resources towards research advancement and innovation. So while the Colorado School of Public Health's values are in alignment with the School of Medicine, we're here to discuss perhaps a different approach and to get feedback. So discussions, just so you know what's happening at the school level, discussions are underway at executive council, at department and center monthly meetings, with the research committee, the faculty affairs committee, at the administrative and professional staff monthly development meetings, and with PIs. Currently, the school is compiling and considering all feedback before we make any decisions, and we wanted to get feedback from everyone today via this town hall. So here's just a look at more detail of what the School of Medicine did. So I indicated that they create, they took the PRA and the Senior PRA series, and they broke it into three job families. They classified each employee into one of the career families. And then at that point, based on resumes, they put or sorry, not based on resumes, based on the job description that PIs provided, they put each job into one of these categories, which is very much like the staff progressional series that many of you might have seen before. This is the School of Medicine's data. So they had 894 professional PRAs, and then they had 410 senior PRAs. And of those employees, who were then categorized into one of the job families and one of the job levels, the majority of their staff then ended up in categories of entry professional to senior professional. And then you can see over here on the left side of the chart, the, the most far left column is directors. So out of the 1,200 or 1,300 so um, PRAs and senior PRAs, there was one director, two program, 12 program directors, and 50 managers. And that's just the distribution of where the School of Medicine employees landed. And then through this very cyclical process, again, their main concerns were external market analysis, really fine tuning those salary ranges. So those the salary ranges have already been established for those three categories. Then they did an internal compensation analysis based on employees' resumes paired with the job description to get um, a specific salary for each employee. They then looked at compression within certain classifications. Merit adjustments is an annual process for every school, and then they reevaluated. And so um, you'll kind of see the cyclical nature of how they plan to continue this analysis. And that's basically it for the School of Medicine and how they, why they did their process, how they went about it um, at a very high level with not too much detail. And then I'd like to pass it off to Sam to talk about what the School of Public Health currently does. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Um, so I've broken this into two pieces. The first slide is where there's, um, the PRA has a bachelor's degree 
And the path with a bachelor's degree, as, as probably most of you know, is fairly limited based on our historical model. But our, our idea of the PRA and historically is to invest in the PRA and give them access to continuing education. So as a faculty position, advancing degrees um, also helps with advancing the career. So with a continuing education, a, a large number of our PRAs are currently in a degree program, either an MPH or an MS or a PhD program. And with those, obviously you can be promoted to senior PRA, a research instructor with the MPH and MS degree. And I'm gonna talk more about that research instructor on the next slide. And if you're a PhD, there's the research associate and assistant professor tracks. So we've thought about PRA as a training path and on to uh, continued education and more responsibility that way. And then if I can go to the next slide, which has people who are coming in with a master's degree. Let's see. Did we lose that slide? There it is. So if they're coming in with a master's degree um, and they might start as a PRA, then get promoted to a senior PRA, um, and I wanted to note PRAs have a limited time that they're supposed to spend on research management. It's a research position. Um, they can get promoted if they have a master's degree, MPH or MS, to a research instructor. And then within the research instructor, there's two levels, a research instructor and a senior research instructor. And I've actually posted from the bylaws the definition of our research instructor, because it's, I think often, not, uh, that's not it, just keep on that slide. <laughs> it's often um, confused as because it has the word instructor, um, the interpretation is that you would be teaching a course. Faculty level, it's not a content. And so by our bylaws, it could be a terminal position, it's a faculty member position, um, have a master's degree or equivalent, well qualified to teach, conduct research, or participate in public health practice um, activities at the school. So this may or may not be a, a position where you're teaching a class. And primarily research instructor is used for people who are doing research and not teaching. And then again, as we value education in our, in our faculty pathways, continuing education, if you're coming in with a master's degree, either an additional master's degree or a PhD, which would either get you to a research associate or an assistant professor pathway. And then Christine, if you wanna show that slide that you were jumping back to, I've got the definitions of PRA. I don't think we'll go through them, um, but those, these are in the bylaws. And so this is the way we've been implementing them. And the bylaws can be found on the Faculty Affairs um, website. And then lastly, I put this staff link, but I, it's actually from the School of Medicine. I found this very helpful to see what was what um, based on the School of Medicine. So that link um, has a number of, of things that you can look at and review. I should also note that I'm, I'm aware of the School of Medicine using that research instructor path for some of their PRAs um, recently. And so I think they, as, as they've been evaluating their PRAs have been also more aware of this path as well. So I think we are open for uh, discussion and conversation. Actually, um... There's some things in chat, um, and Bobby, can we, are those participating, are they able to uh, just talk instead of chat? Can we promote those who want to make a comment to speak, actually? Let me see if I can, Nikki's got a question, Let me see, or Nick, I'm sorry. We'll yeah. So I, I think what we could do, I think I pr prefer to have this not by chat, but by conversation. So maybe what we can do is 
Okay, I promoted Nick. Can you hear me? Yeah, we do. Yeah, so go ahead, Nick, with your uh, with your question and uh, and 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 everybody. All I, I think we listed a couple of things that you know that we would like to hear your thoughts about, and and of course anything else is anything else. So as a full time PRA, one of the things that I value about my position is that I get the opportunity to continue my education and do so through the tuition assistance program. Since we'll be restructuring the career path within the PRA series, will there be a change in how that tuition assistance um, is offered to those who are eligible? I can answer that. So there might be many questions today that I won't know the answer for, but we are committed to find the answers. But this is um, a very simple answer. Yes, absolutely. All those tuition benefits, the nine credit hours a year, continue for any employee of the university, no matter what job classification, as long as you're at that minimum FTE level to be eligible. Okay. And um, let's see, Nicole. Carlson, uh, I'll, I'll read uh, Nicole's question. Uh, can you comment on the typical level that a person with a master's degree enters into the staff and how you see this addressing the limited number of titles available, if it does at all? Actually, why don't you, uh, Bob, let's just promote everybody else's comments. So if you can get Nicole. Yeah, Nicole's on, on right I'm now. Here. So yeah, I'm just curious. I've gotten feedback from my team about one of their challenges when they have a master's degree is that how they feel advancement. And I'm just curious if based on School of Medicine that you know the titles actually are have enough titles in it. So I'm just curious. I'm just curious, Christine, your thoughts on seeing what they've done or Sam, where those master's people would come in in the staff track. I don't have access to data, but we can find out. Um, there is a large portion of our staff who have master's degrees. We just did an educational analysis on our staff. Um, but I don't have that in front of me, so I don't. I didn't do a uh, an education analysis with job level analysis, but we can get that for you. Yeah, so I live it, and I guess I just love us to think about how many levels there are above that, and how many will get what we'll put in air quotes because I'm not on video stuck in in a title the same way that they might feel stuck as a research instructor or a senior PRA, and if we can add to the list of working with HR to resolve that in the future, even if it can't be done now. Yeah, and Christine, could you sneak back to the master's slide that I made? Um, because I did try, um, this, is, this is a first guess. Um, ah, I don't have it on this one. There's a couple, I'm going to uh, look on my, my screen. There's a couple of levels that are possible and let me read them. Um, if, we, if we went with the research services that PRA to staff, um, if they had a, a master's degree, they probably go in at a program manager where they might be managing a project and possibly a promotion to a manager. Beyond that, we start to get into high levels. So people could stop at, at one of those levels. So there's not a broad range of levels um, to go up that most people would achieve. And I would say most all of this is tied to job duties. So education aside, it's the duties that will determine where, and if, and, and if your question is if there's enough levels, we can look into that and work with central HR right now, the levels are what the levels are, and it's duties that drive you to each of the levels. But each of those levels has micro levels of, you know, entry to fully efficient, you know, things like that. So that's why there's a whole salary band for each of those levels. And that's why many people with the same education experience, but perhaps differing um, levels of years of experience within their um, expertise would have different salaries within a specific range, but with the same title. And I wonder, um, Christine, if you go back to that sort of last slide with the topics, would would like to get um, input and thoughts about the uh, appointment in a faculty series of titles versus a staff series of titles, because that would be a, 
it's a it's a fundamental change it has it has operational implications for the school in terms of how hiring is done and who does the hiring and and processing but there's also a change in you know how the position one holds is explained is it faculty or is it um staff so for for those who um are pras who are with us today what are what are your thoughts about um about this and and please um this is one of the important uh points for input so if somebody could indicate their willingness to comment uh, we'll get you on uh, verbally so please uh, indicate your thoughts in the chat and we can promote you to converse. Yeah, let's see, Nick's got his- Well, and of, Sarah yeah. was first, and I think that Bobby's working on getting Sarah oh, okay. access. So if you raise your hand, Bobby can then enable the access to speak. Yes. Yeah, Sarah, you're on. Yeah, I think um, one of my concerns is just that it's, it's based you know, whatever category you get put into is kind of based on your job description. And I know for a lot of people, their job descriptions are like woefully out of date or inaccurate. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what kind of guidance is going to be given to managers and employees or, you know, PRAs on how to write those um, in a way that's reflective of what their contributions are. Um, because I think sometimes those job descriptions fit hiring, but maybe not kind of the ongoing, how the job changes. Yeah, absolutely. Job descriptions would need to be relooked at. And the School of Medicine solution to that was creating job description templates that then could have um, additions to the unique natures of jobs. Um, but yes, a, definitely a good point of consideration of accurate job descriptions and training on creating job descriptions. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so Nick has a question and Deanna has a question. Okay. To kind of touch on what Sarah says. I think that's a great way of getting someone into the, the CU system and to start working, but it maybe doesn't address um, how to keep that updated or most current at what your job description is. So maybe like a maybe an annual um, reevaluation of, hey, what are we doing? Kind of when we do that market adjustment. Um, but the question I was gonna have and voice was that, will the restructuring as it's been proposed at this webinar, based on the job tasks that you perform, will that limit a PRA's ability to utilize different strengths and weaknesses? So for example, maybe someone's more their their strength is like in the lab right doing lab research um pipetting and doing all of that fun things not things that i'm great at but um will that limit their ability to do that versus maybe do more on the coordination side of things um when they don't necessarily have like a bachelor's degree in chemistry or maybe it's a master's degree in chemistry or or would that other variations. So I guess what happens when those tasks don't align with your credentials and where your strengths and weaknesses fall? So I'll come at the Nick first. I mean, we we don't have a specific proposal for moving forward yet. I mean, I just want to be really clear about that because we don't know what the right way forward is yet for the school. And, and you know, part of our conversation today is to try and get input on what might be the right way. So I, I guess if you probably the I think the answer your question probably originates with the job categories that were families were proposed by medicine where you sort of fit into one family or the rigidity with which people have been put into a category and uh, defined strictly by that category. I suspect that's been quite variable from. Um, you know, uh, group to group within medicine. I and I don't. I don't know, Christine, if you have any insights at all about sort of the functionality of what medicine is doing. Let me be clear: this is what medicine is doing, and not necessarily what we're going to do. Yeah. So well, I think what I hear from Nick is just a concern for the limitations of a specific job classification right. and 
the um, you know, whatever model we come up with should have the ability for someone to dabble across the board. Is, is that sort of it, Nick? Yes, thank you. Okay, and thank you. Nick, I wanted to ask, are you thinking um, if somebody truly wants to do science rather than management, is there a path for them? Um, not all of our PRAs want to move forward into management. They want to write code or be in the lab. I, I think I was more speaking from my personal experience. Um, I'm currently in the MPH program. And when I was hired um, by my supervisor, my, my skill set didn't just didn't quite align with what she was exactly needing. We were in the unique situation where she was able to hire two people and work with her budget to make that work and that so that she got all that she needed from both of us that she brought onto the team. But um, it just raised the question of what happens if we classify employees by these very task oriented roles and they don't necessarily fit those tasks at the level that they're currently at. Let's see, Deanna. Hi, um, I'm Deanna. I just, I guess, wondered similarly, um, if we, if the university changes the association of PRAs from faculty to staff, Will that automatically change anything um, in how the PRAs relate to the university in terms of benefits, um, resources, and access? The analysis that the School of Medicine did as far as what your health benefits are, et cetera, are just same. Nothing, nothing will change. Um, the one change that I've seen is PREs used to PREs now are eligible for an increase January one, whereas staff positions are only eligible for a merit increase once a year. Um, you know, from history, very few PREs ever received raises mid year unless there was a compression or equity issue, and so those would be addressed anyway, regardless of which series you would be in. But benefit to benefit, I haven't seen anything that would indicate that there would be any difference to access to benefits or access to the campus or any resources in, in that regard. Okay, good to know. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> let's see, was somebody else commenting? I was gonna read one comment in the chat. Uh, Dina, just, were uh, you finished? Yeah, Deanna, were you finished? Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you so much. Um, please go ahead. Yeah, and so I, just a comment from uh, Aaron Poole, who uh, just sent a comment by chat about uh, the, uh, I guess, saying that she would be disappointed to lose uh, the classification as um, faculty. And then following on to that, we need to provide career paths for promotion recognition while retaining faculty status and the unique role PR is playing in the development administration of um, research. So I, I think um, Aaron is speaking directly to that first bullet and saying for her that the faculty role is important and that you know, perhaps what we need to be um, looking at is you know, the pathways for promotion within the PRA, uh, for advancement within the PRA track. So thank, thanks, Erin, uh, for the comment. And, and the other, other thoughts on this point, which was, is an important one for us, would be really helpful. So I'll, I'll take silence as no one else is going to probably uh, comment, but would certainly uh, welcome your feedback on this um, on this point. Um, uh, let's see, and a comment from uh, Sarah Mumby. Uh, what is the timeline? Uh, I you know I've, I I'm going to say deliberate. Uh, because we want to have input and understand uh, that if there 
is to be a change, what uh, the implications are. We need to do some uh, modeling of the financial consequences of whatever the change is. Uh, we would need to be working with uh, HR, uh, sort of going through that cycle that uh, Christine showed the School of Medicine went through. I mean, we would have to have some of those same uh, inter interactions. So this is a, um, a timetable that's a, not a matter of weeks or months, but I, I would say a lot of months. But um, Christine, Sam, please comment. Christine, do you want to go first? Oh, you, you can. Uh, well, I would just echo what John said. Um, we, are, we are investigating and um, listening, and we would like to, to make this happen as soon as we can, but clearly we need to make sure we choose the right path. Yeah. Christine? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't disagree with John and Sam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I, and I think um, this goes back, um, Aaron has posted another uh, important comment, is there a committee of PRAs or senior PRAs who are part of these discussions and decisions at the school level? I, you know, I, I mean, again, Aaron, a, a very fair question. I mean, we will have a very open, engaged process that, you know, clearly, you know, having PRAs and senior PRAs directly involved will be um, critical. I mean, I, you know, we want this to be a collective um, decision. I, I get the sense that whatever path we may go, it may not be the one that everyone would choose, but we will try and get there by consensus and, uh, and, and, and open engagement with all those who will be um, affected. Some, some parts of this um, are, what what would happen if we did take the pathway of change? Um, there are parts of this that lie outside the school with HR and uh, their considerations about you know salary implications and so on. What classifications might be chosen would be an internal matter. So uh, parts of this would be internal to school and certainly involve uh, PRAs and senior PRAs and figure out the right way to do that. Um, yeah. Hi, am I live? Yep. I'm wondering if School of Medicine has shared any data on how this change has affected their salary bands or salary adjustments for their former PRAs. Detail, no, we have not seen detail. I mean, we've heard anecdotes, Lisa, but that's about that's about it. I mean, I, I think one one point to make is that in terms of actual salary levels, there was no one was received a decrease in the salary level for their position. Did it raise the minimum entry level salary? I don't even know what the minimum salary was that they were offering when they started this. So I, I don't know. Um, the salary bands are new and I don't know if the salary ban lowest minimum is higher, you know, yeah, I, we don't know. Well, we, we have um, plenty of time left for further discussion if there are other um, uh, topics, comments, um, you know, this is, you know, we want, we want input and, uh, be pleased to hear, you know, whatever may be on your mind. I, and, um, you know, you may have heard stories from the school of medicine. I mean, any, any 
concerns, we may not be able to address them specifically because they haven't set out our directions. But again, we want to hear um, anything that would be helpful at just this initial phase of getting started. Give a minute for last thoughts. Deanna has a question. Uh, bosses, <laughs> you know, I uh, I'll take a first crack, at Deanna, at your question. I mean, I I think, and see if Christine and Sam want to follow what might be considered the losses and gains of the change. I mean, you know, part of that is, you know, why we wanted to start with this kind of session and discussion and hear what's on your mind. And if we make a move towards a change, certainly we'll come back with uh, a, a more detailed analysis of what the losses and gains may be. And I, you know, I guess those losses and gains are for, you know, individuals who are PR, PRAs, senior PRAs, they are for the uh, research groups where they um, where they work and for the schools, so there's different levels of potential losses and gains of making a change. I mean, I, I think the um, a, a big change would be going from a faculty series to a staff series, and that has implications for the school and a shift in workload uh, away from the Office of Faculty Affairs to uh, our human resources. Uh, so there's changes uh, there. There's, um, and you know, we heard from one, one participant that being in a faculty series is important. So if that were uh, potentially a, a personal loss in terms of how you view your position and how you explain what you do as a, as a, as a faculty member versus a staff member, that could potentially be a loss for some. I, you know, I hope that if we do make a change, that whatever the direction we go comes with gains, and um, and I think from the school perspective, that might be uh, our ability to hire um, individuals uh, into positions uh, and. You know, do do better in the uh, marketplace because of the uh, because of the change. That would be a, um, a a gain if we uh, had a new approach that offered you know greater opportunities for uh, advancement within the series. That would be a, a beneficial change. So I, I I think we'll have to line uh, line these up. But I you know we will be doing you know, detailed analysis, clearly the financial consequences of any change uh, would, be, uh, would be important uh, as, as well. And I don't know, Christine May, you know, how much modeling the School of Medicine did, but I suspect they did a fair amount as they looked at the change from PRAs and the PRA series to um, the staff series that they have uh, implemented. So uh, Christine, do you want to Comment. I mean, it's really it's, it's a, a question of great importance. It sort of is will be at the heart of making a decision on if we make changes and what those changes might be. Yeah, I, I think essentially the goals of um, retention are at the forefront of this. Seventy percent of the school's financial revenue comes from research, so this is not a decision that the school will make lightly. Um, PRAs and senior PRAs are a valued part of our employee repertoire. So um, I think the gains here are all listed in what the School of Medicine goals were, and we just need to work together to figure out how we obtain those goals and, and achieve them. And we'll, we'll do that through open communication and back and forth and enlisting our PIs and managers, um, as well as the PRAs and senior PRAs um, in the process. So we're we're excited to see what the solution portion of this will, will bring with the hopes of achieving those outcomes. And I would probably jump in with, you know, the, the switch from 
faculty to staff um, seems like a big one for me, but I'm not sure that it's a big one for everybody. So I think the pros and cons will differ by individuals. Um, I've heard a mention that I haven't heard uh, earlier today of will this impact recruiting? Um, if, if we're recruiting to a staff position, will we get a different mix of um, people who, who apply for the job versus if it's, a, if it's a faculty position? I don't know if that's um, happened within the School of Medicine, but we've seen a couple of cases where advertising might have brought in a couple of different people that we might not have gotten in otherwise. So possible. Um, but again, I do think there's some individual pieces, uh, individual preferences. And I think either way, we will continue to value education within the school um, for um, our PRAs or whatever our PRAs are called next, if we do make any changes. Okay, well, I think we have um, had some good input. I wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, again, I will say that um, this town hall was an important part of our initial uh, planning to have uh, input from the PRAs. This <clears throat> by no means will be the last. And um, I can assure you that we'll have a process for considering change that will uh, involve the PRAs uh, of the school. And, you know, as Christine, Sam have said, and I will reiterate, uh, you are a critical part of the school uh, community and critical to our uh, mission in, uh, in research and, and to having a vital uh, community at the, uh, at the school. Uh, I'm sorry I, that we're not together in uh, person. Um, it's, uh, it's not as easy to have this kind of meeting and discussion by Zoom, but I think we've, we've had a good conversation and I want to thank you all for uh, joining. So thanks and-, and well, I would just say this is being recorded and you know we didn't have full representation from everybody today. So we will send this out and we welcome feedback uh, via email, you know, as soon as everybody is able to to view the recording and provide feedback. Sure. And if you have further comments, again, send them on, uh, whether to Sam, Christine, uh, or my or myself, and and we want uh, we want your input. So thanks all, and uh, enjoy the short week ahead. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>